This video was sponsored by Raycon. Whoa! Huh. I I'm back at home with my desk. There are no alternate universe Arlos. The multiverse hasn't been shattered. Everything's back to normal. I'm so happy, I just want to sing! And talk about my Raycon Everyday Earbuds. They're so small and sleek with their great new rubber oil design, and they fit perfectly in my ears thanks to the assortment of silicone tips they came with. They're so comfortable that I can wear them all day. And sometimes I really do wear them all day because they get up to eight hours on a charge and up to 32 hours using the convenient charging case. The sound quality is great. And oh, who could forget, they pack a surprising amount of bass. And when my non bizarre friends want to call me, I can take those calls at the press of a button thanks to the built-in mic. Raycon Everyday Earbuds are less than half the price of other premium wireless earbuds and people can go to buyraycon.com slash Arlo to unlock exclusive deals of up to 15% off. They come in five different colors, so they make excellent gifts. They even come with a 45-day happiness guarantee. Free shipping and returns? How magical! So head to that URL or follow the link down in the description to get your very own pair of Raycons. Ah! Champa! 2022 is looking like the next 2017. One of those years where the games start coming and they don't stop coming. Fed to the rules and I hit the ground running. Point is, in all seriousness, it's gonna be an all-star year for games. Nintendo's got loads of releases slated for 2022, just loads. And even if they don't announce one single additional game, it's already going to be one of the best years of the Switch's life. But even beyond Nintendo, 2022 is looking mighty fine. Gigantic clusters of incredible games are crowding the whole schedule. For those with particularly diverse gaming tastes, prepare to be left with a shrunken, desiccated wallet that turns to dust and blows away in the wind when you try to open it. I myself have a tremendous number of games that I'm hyped for. Maybe even too many. I have no idea how I'll find time to play them all. But hey, that's the way I like it and I'll never get bored. Seeing as there's so much to do, so much to see, I'd like to try something new and go over my top 10 most highly anticipated games of the coming year. So without further ado, let's get the show on. First up, this isn't technically a game, but rather a DLC, though knowing how Capcom has handled this kind of thing in the past, it <laughs> basically is a game. My number one gaming obsession in 2021 was Monster Hunter Rise. I was put off by many elements of the series in the past, but I finally decided to give this one a go and ended up falling madly in love. The incredible combat, the lifelike monsters, the deeply addictive feedback loop, it all invaded my life for a time. Well, in 2022, Capcom is giving us Sunbreak, a large DLC expansion. And though not much is known about it, it's basically guaranteed to drastically expand the game's scope and provide a massive amount of new content. I'm actually pretty intimidated by the idea of such a thing. Rise has already taken up much of my life, but that doesn't stop me from drooling over that Sunbreak teaser, dreaming about what it might be like. And while we're talking about it, if you're considering getting into Monster Hunter, I'll tell you what everyone told me at first. There's never been a better time to get in. The water's getting warm, so you might as well swim. Let it be known that I ain't the sharpest tool in the shed. Complicated strategy in RPG games tend to confuse the heck out of me, but triangle strategy looks like it's right up my alley. I, quite unfortunately, still haven't set aside time to play all the way through Octopath Traveler, but the demo offered me a perfect balance of strategic depth and intuitive simplicity. Triangle strategy looks to be very similar, with the kind of strategy gameplay I can actually wrap my head around. I haven't played too many strategy games, but I've adored the ones I've gotten into. And this one comes with the added benefit of a super duper gorgeous art style. I absolutely adore how this game looks. The mix of sprites and sprite-like 3D environments, the lighting effects, it's just got this cozy, magical vibe. And judging by the trailers, it'll probably have a pretty good story as well. I very much fear that Triangle Strategy will end up being a repeat of Octopath Traveler for me. A game that I really want to play, but is a hard sell for 60 bucks when I've already got so many other games on my backlog. Here's hoping that won't happen though, because Triangle Strategy looks like it's going to be one of the highlights of the Switch's 2022. 
Pokemon games are wildly, wildly popular. The series has got a massive fan base, though it also draws a lot of criticism for failing to evolve quickly enough. The core formula has remained mostly the same for the 25 years of Pokemon's life so far. While there is much conflict within the community, there's one thing that nearly everyone, including the series' staunch supporters, agrees on. We could all use a little change. Well, Pokemon Legends Arceus looks like it just might be the change we've all been waiting for. We still don't know exactly how it will function, but we know it involves roaming very wide open spaces and often engaging with angry Pokemon in real-time encounters. Turn-based combat is present, but for the first time seems to have been altered in a meaningful way. As a notorious Pokemon critic, I'm trying to be cautiously optimistic about this game. If I'm being completely honest, I don't have much faith in the Pokemon Company. From a technical standpoint, what I've seen so far looks embarrassingly shoddy. But I love what Legends Arceus is going for, and I'm very eager to try it out. I like a lot of what I've seen so far, and it looks like it's got potential. If it's gonna usher in a new era of Pokemon, I want to be there to experience it. This is the most excited I've been for a Pokemon game in my whole adult life. Somebody once told me, the world is gonna roll me. And when it comes to online multiplayer games, they were 100% right. I'm terrible at most shooters, and Splatoon is no exception. I drag down every team I'm ever put on, and I rarely see victory. These games keep me coming back, however, because of the overall experiences they offer. The world, the lore, the art style, the character designs, and of course, the exceedingly clever and perfectly polished gameplay. And while the single player elements might not be the main focus, I find them wonderful. Splatoon campaigns are these ingenious bursts of frantic shooting and platforming, with designs so clever you'd think you were playing a Mario game. Right now, we know a little bit about Splatoon 3, the location, some of the new weapons and such. I have no doubt it's gonna be another worthy entry in the series, but personally, I'm waiting for that new campaign, whatever it might end up looking like. Will it be another five-hour-ish by-the-numbers kind of thing, or something bigger and deeper like Octo Expansion? Ooh, then you got Salmon Run, which is the one multiplayer mode I'm into because it's not competitive. Assuming the mode returns, I would probably cry if it didn't, I would absolutely love some added depth. More variants, different kinds of levels with different goals, a deeper progression system, maybe even some classes or something? I guess I'm not gonna get my hopes up about all that, but I'm still on the edge of my seat waiting for more info. I really didn't expect another Splatoon to hit the Switch this generation, but now that it's coming, I'm sure it will not disappoint. Mario & Rabbids Kingdom Battle is a wonderful little gem on Switch. Fun strategy gameplay, terrific presentation, and the kind of epic story Mario and his friends aren't often allowed to get involved in. To my great initial surprise, the Rabbids don't bring the experience down, and are actually decently funny if you ask me. And Mario & Rabbids Sparks of Hope looks like it's gonna be the perfect sequel. A grander scope, new characters, even better visuals, exciting new combat elements, a bigger overworld to explore, or it's also naturally being made by Ubisoft, which is not a company I want to be supporting right now. But it's made by one of their smaller teams who are obviously incredibly passionate about the project, but it's also being made by Ubisoft, which is not a company I want to be supporting right now. But it's also a joint effort with Nintendo, who's usually very protective of their IPs, and the success of a project like this can potentially lead to more similar projects. But it's also being made by Ubisoft, which is not a company I want to be supporting right now. Oh, I don't know. I'll have to wait and see. I guess when it comes to justifying our support of certain game companies, the ice we skate is getting pretty thin. Especially when you've got a family, a peaceful existence is all you can really hope for. But the meteor men beg to differ. <laughs> Sorry, where was I? Somerville sees a family trying to survive what appears to be an alien apocalypse. I haven't seen much gameplay, but I really don't care to. This game is being led by one of the co-founders of Playdead, who jumped ship a few years ago to start his own company, Jump Ship. 
Limbo is a very special game to me, and Inside is one of my very favorite games of all time. Somerville clearly has a lot of that Play Dead DNA, and even if the creator keeps saying it's not a puzzle platformer like its predecessors, I don't much care what the gameplay is like. Maybe things will be different when I finally get to sit down and play it, but at the moment, I'm all hype. I want to play Somerville, and I want to play it bad. Here's hoping it makes the agonizing wait for Play Dead's third game at least slightly more bearable. <sighs> It's no secret that I was not a fan of Kirby Star Allies. Between the laughably short length, the lack of compelling mechanics, the almost non-existent difficulty, and the AI partners that did everything for me, the game frequently made me throw up my hands and go, I need to get myself away from this place. I've been told by many Kirby fans that good Kirby games do exist and I believe them, though I haven't had the chance to play any of them yet. The thing is, I like Kirby. I like the character, I like the style, I like a lot of the gameplay elements. I genuinely want to play a Kirby game that excites me. Kirby and the Forgotten Land excites me. I've been begging Nintendo to make more 3D games for years, and now we're getting a 3D Kirby? And it takes place in a weird post-apocalypse city? Sign me up. Sign me the heck up. This is another game I don't know much about yet, but it's legitimately one of the games I'm most excited for in 2022. It's a 3D Kirby game. It's a 3D Nintendo adventure. It takes place in a weird post- I, I really can't wait to play it. <laughs> Space is a cool place. And they say it gets colder. Fortunately, sci-fi allows us to imagine a version of space that's full of life. Starfield is a sci-fi game that, unfortunately, does have some stuff going against it. Bethesda was once a beloved company, but in recent years, they've done much to tarnish their reputation. They've become more aggressive when it comes to profit, and have chased after the more profitable live service model even when it doesn't fit. Fallout 76 itself, launched as a broken, buggy mess devoid of content and seen by many as an abject failure to push the series into the multiplayer realm, is a testament to their decline. However, they've put out some great games in recent years, and there's no knowing how the Microsoft acquisition might change the company culture. So until I'm given a solid reason why Starfield is going to miss the mark, I'm gonna be pretty darn hyped for it. The Elder Scrolls formula is a heck of a good one, and I've put countless hours into Oblivion and Skyrim. Then Fallout took that formula, tweaked it, added to it, and delivered an epic experience in a totally different genre. So now the idea of Elder Scrolls, but in space? I'm drooling. I'm drooling! Out of all the games on this list, I probably know the least about Starfield. Bethesda's doing that super annoying thing where they drop teaser trailers with zero substance and give info in interviews, instead of just, like doing a big reveal that shows us what the game is like? I never understand it when companies do that. But hey, like I said, Elder Scrolls in space. Need I say more? Elder Scrolls in space, gimme! I finished Breath of the Wild. Then I said, hey, how about a sequel to Breath of the Wild? Then Nintendo said, hey, do you want a sequel to Breath of the Wild? And I said, yep, what a concept. At the time of this recording, the game is still shrouded in mystery, though the snippets Nintendo's shown off have been enough to get the blood pumping, especially that first trailer. I love Spooky Zelda. It is unfortunate that it's been two and a half years since that trailer, and honestly, it has dampened my hype a little. I can't keep up such hype for that long. However, whenever I really stop to think about it, I start to feel that hype again. And I'm sure when Nintendo does the full reveal, it'll all kick into overdrive. The first Breath of the Wild is one of my favorite games, as you very likely know, so I don't think it's much of a surprise that the sequel is near the top of my list. Will they manage to fix a lot of the problems I had with the original? Will they be able to change Hyrule enough to make it feel fresh to explore again? I don't know, but golly gosh darn, I'ma find out. We've waited long enough for this game, and I'm ready to play it. As I said, it's probably not surprising that Breath of the Wild 2 is high on my list, but what might be surprising is that it's not at the top. In fact, the game at the top of this 2022 hype list is not a Nintendo game at all. I spent many a year not understanding the appeal of Dark Souls. 
Then when the first game was coming to Switch, I played the network test and I still didn't get it. The combat seemed slow and sluggish and the crushing difficulty made me want to quit. I mean, why would I submit myself to such a thing? It didn't make sense not to live for fun. But something compelled me. I pressed on and eventually it clicked. I picked up the full game and while it was indeed a grueling experience in many ways, it was also magical. Lordran is one of the most incredible video game worlds I've ever explored. Since playing Dark Souls, I haven't played any other FromSoft games. I've wanted to, but I wasn't ready for the time and energy investment, especially because of how much of my time in Dark Souls was wasted running back to bosses after dying. Enter Elden Ring. The latest FromSoft game offers that classic Souls formula, but within a big open world. I was lucky enough to get into the network test and played quite a few hours of the early game. I did not want it to stop. Elden Ring's world is gorgeous. The combat feels great. The baddies are as awesome as ever. Exploring feels incredible. There are dungeons. And the best part, at least in the network test, checkpoints right before bosses. <gasps> The desire to play another FromSoft game has only grown and grown since playing Dark Souls. And now that I've gotten a taste of Elden Ring, I need more. Like, you don't even know. I need this game. I really want to play all the games on this list, but Elden Ring is the only one that makes me feel that very rare, very special kind of hype. That deep, deep longing. I think about it every day. I daydream about exploring the world. I'm chomping at the bit to get another shot at the boss I couldn't beat in the network test. I'm very lucky the game comes out in a few months because this is the kind of hype that is not sustainable. My body will begin to break down. <laughs> my mind will begin to decay if I don't get my hands on Elden Ring soon. Hey now, that might be the end of the list, but I've got a handful of honorable mentions. These are games that I'm sure I would be hyped about, but I haven't gotten around to playing the games that came before them yet, so I probably won't be uh, playing them this year. In no particular order. Horizon Forbidden West. I cannot believe it's been nearly five years since it came out, but I still haven't played Zero Dawn. It looks like something I'll really, really enjoy though, so someday I'm sure I'll also enjoy its sequel. A Plague Tale Requiem. I heard a lot of great things about the first Plague Tale and it looks really beautiful and really cool. Just haven't played it yet, but that's life, I guess. I'm sure Requiem will be great. Blossom Tales 2. I've started the first game multiple times and I love what I've played, but I just keep getting distracted for whatever reason. But it's getting a sequel in 2022 that I will play sometime. I promise. Finally, God of War Ragnarok. I was never a fan of the God of War series, but the new one looked super cool. I've got the game and everything, I just haven't played it yet. Ragnarok will probably end up being pretty cool though, huh? Yep, probably. I'll get around to it sometime. And that's that. Which of these shooting stars will end up breaking the mold? Who knows? I certainly don't believe all that glitters is gold, but I'm feeling quite optimistic. As far as 2022's game lineup goes, my world's on fire. How about yours? I'll never know if you don't go down to those comments and tell me which titles you're most excited for. I'll catch you later. And in the meantime, I'll be waiting here for the calendar to roll over. And when that time finally comes, my friends, get your game on. Go play.